Welcome to the 2012 Fall Webinar Series sponsored by the United States Department of Agriculture's People's Garden Initiative. For the next hour, you'll be learning wet and dry seed processing methods. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our technical facilitator, Jerry Schneider, and the rest of our virtual hosts at Kansas State University. I'm Annie Cicerini with USDA's People's Garden Initiative. Today's instructor is Shannon Carmody, who is the Public Programs Manager for Seed Savers Exchange. Seed Savers Exchange is a nonprofit, member-supported organization that permanently maintains thousands of open-pollinated and heirloom varieties of seed for future generations. They do this by collecting, growing, and sharing heirloom seeds and plants. The People's Garden Initiative is proud to have Seed Savers Exchange as a founding member of our partnership forum. Shannon joined us last year and taught a webinar that introduced us to seed saving. We're glad to have her back to teach us how to process and store seeds. Originally from Rock Island, Illinois, Shannon now lives in gardens in Decorah, Iowa. Participants can ask Shannon questions via Twitter using hashtag AskPGI. I will ask Shannon these questions at the end of this session. The title of today's presentation is Seed Saving, Processing, and Storage. Shannon, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Annie, and um, hello, everybody from Iowa. Um, this workshop, I will be discussing seed processing and harvesting. Um, and this is the process of removing mature seed from the fruit or the pod and getting it clean and into packages, much like you would find if you were buying seed uh, for your garden. I'd like to start by just saying that this workshop assumes a couple of things that we covered in the first uh, webinar. And those things are that you are saving seed from open pollinated varieties or varieties that when you save the seed, and you plant them the following year, you get the same seed um, with the same characteristics as you did the year before. So that's one thing you want to make sure you're doing before you get to the seed processing. And the other thing you need to do is to make sure that you're saving seed that hasn't cross-pollinated with other varieties um, in the same species. So for example, if you had a yellow tomato and you had um, a small red cherry tomato and you let them grow next to each other and they cross-pollinated, you might end up with something different than um, the following year than you had previously. So um, I'm not going to get too much into those things because we get to talk about the fun part this time, which is the processing and getting the seed um, out of the plant. If you have more questions about that, you can check out the previous webinar. Uh, so just a little bit about Seed Savers Exchange. Um, as Annie mentioned, our mission is to save North America's diverse but endangered garden heritage for future generations. And we do this here at the farm by maintaining um, a large seed bank. And we do this um, also by our network of members, which I will tell you a little bit about. And I'm telling you about this because once you have all this seed that you've saved, this is a great thing to do um, with your extra seed. So in 1975, our co-founders, Diane Otwaley and her husband, Kent, um, received these seeds from their grandfather, the morning glory you see in the tomato. It's called the Hungarian, or excuse me, the German pink tomato and the Grandpa Ott's morning glory. And when she got these seeds, she realized, okay, if we don't save these seeds, who's going to save them? And um, also realized that maybe there are other people in a similar situation. So they put some ads in magazines to see, you know, who has these endangered seeds that have been passed in their family. And in 1977, there were about six people, um, and they were listed in this exchange here. Um, and they saved and grew and shared each other's seeds so that if somebody lost someone crop failure or somebody was sick and couldn't get out into the garden, somebody else was out there growing their rare seeds. Um, so again, this is in 1997, and here it is in 2011, um, and it's about 500 pages now with about 13,000 different varieties and 700 or so members sharing and exchanging those varieties. So um, anyone can become a part of the exchange, and it's a great way to exchange seeds person to person and a great way to unload some of the seed that you'll be saving now that you know how to. So a couple reasons on why to save seed. Um, I'm hoping that because you're here, maybe you already know 
why you want to. Um, something that I find a lot around here with the old time gardeners in Iowa is that um, seed saving really isn't a skill. It's just something people used to do. Everyone used to save seeds. So it's just kind of a turn back to um, the traditional farming practices. Um, you'll save money, or in my case, you'll um, get to save money in order to buy new varieties for your garden. Um, but you'll find how much seed you'll have and, and how much you can share. And hopefully, if you're in a community where other people are saving seed, um, you will save a significant amount of money in the spring when those beautiful seed catalogs come. Um, and you might want to maintain your own collection of unique vegetable varieties. Hopefully, um, maybe you're lucky enough to encounter somebody who's had a variety in their family. Maybe you have a family member who's had a variety in their family, um, and they share it with you. Um, this is something you can't get in seed catalogs, or you can't get commercially. So it's, it is important to maintain those um, and be able to pass those on as well. Um, or maybe, in some cases, you just have a favorite tomato, and you can't remember what the heck it is. And so you, um, you have to save it out of necessity, because you want to be able to grow in the future. And also, varieties are dropped from seed catalogs. They might not be available in the marketplace the following year, and it could have been one of your favorite tomatoes. So by saving seed, you're helping to maintain genetic diversity in the food system when, when things fall out of commercial favor. So as we discuss seed processing, it's, it's easiest to do, um, break it into two categories. You have dry seed processing and wet seed processing. And first, I will discuss um, the dry seed process. So dry seeds um, are seeds of a plant that, that are contained in a pod or a husk. Um, the mature dry state is in, um, is in a dead brown, um, gray looking husk. Um, they're usually mixed with stems, sticks, dirt, leaves by the time you harvest them. So the, the harvesting and processing process is kind of eliminating all of this other stuff from the seed. Um, dry seed families include brassicas, so all of your kales, cauliflowers, kohlrabis, um, cabbages, all of those are going to be dry seed. Um, your spinaches, lettuces, all of the beans, peas, um, and celery, carrots, those are all going to fall into the dry seed process. Um, and also in this category, dry seeds will either be a biennial or they'll be an annual. And if you're new to seed saving, annual is a really great place to start because um, you get to do it all in the same year. Um, and it's just a little easier, a little easier of a place to start. So an annual crop will require one growing season to produce seed um, and complete its life cycle. These are great beginner ones like beans and tomatoes and lettuces, but also squash is a annual broccoli, some kinds of broccoli and and corn. Um, on the other hand, a biennial requires two growing seasons to produce seed. And this might be a little bit counterintuitive because many things that we consider annuals, like carrots and beets and that sort of thing, are annuals because we eat them in the first year. Um, not, they're not annuals because um, it takes them two seasons to go through and complete their life cycle and produce seed. So um, what this means is that biennials must have a period of vernalization. They have to vernalize in order to survive the winter. Um, and that means that they need to be below a certain temperature, usually about 50 degrees, for 8 to 12 weeks. And for those of you who are tuning in from places where the ground doesn't freeze too, too much of the winter, um, certainly not here in Iowa, you can almost leave these in the ground as long as they get below 50 degrees for 8 to 12 weeks, depending. Um, and then they'll set seed the following year. If you live in a colder area where the ground is frozen, then um, certainly you've seen this in your garden where your root crops might turn to mush over the course of the winter, you will not be able to just do that. So you'll actually have to dig them out of the garden, store them in a root cellar, and then replant them in the spring. So biennials are probably not the best um, choice for beginners, um, but you know, once you grow one carrot for seed, you're going to have enough carrot for a couple years. So they do reward you with lots of seed. And just again to break it out with the annuals and the biennials, um, lettuce and peas, which you know those are both great for beginners. Corn, radish, and spinach are all annuals. And then we have your biennials on your right. The photo that you see on the right hand, um, you see you can kind of see all those really pale green, sickly-looking plants. This is early spring when we're replanting um, 
the biennials that have been overwintered. And you can see they desperately need a little sunlight and they will set seed pretty early. If you are overwintering your biennials, <clears throat> you can plant them out as soon as the, um, the ground is workable. They're pretty cold hardy. All right, so you've grown your seed, um, and so now you need to know when to harvest it. When is the seed fully mature? Um, and you can look for a couple indicators. Color is certainly a good indicator. It might be brown or gray or, or black in some cases. Um, but mostly you're going to look for something that's kind of dead looking. Um, dryness of seed and the seed pod. So sometimes if, if the seed is not dry enough, you're going to notice it's going to be squishy. Or maybe you can bend the beans or, or make a dent in them with your finger. Um, but if they're really dry, sometimes they might split open on their own, and that's the case with this lima bean, where the seed's really dried, and it pops open, and, and that's kind of its natural mechanism for dispersal. So <clears throat> harvesting them somewhere um, before they burst open and, and self-seed in your garden, but, but long after they've, they've dried and are fully plump and um, ready for, for storage. And again, how they detach from the, the pod or the stalk. Will, will be a good indicator. They should do that pretty easily. And again, with, with dry seed, um, sometimes things might um, dry over a period of time. So you might want to have your beans out on a, uh, a bean teepee or a bean, um, some sort of trellis, and you can harvest the dry ones as the, the new ones continue to set, with pole beans anyway. One thing to look out for uh, with harvesting your dry seed is that environmental factors may affect your harvest. And so what you're looking at here is um, sunflowers, which would fall into the dry seed category. And you can see a lot of brown leaves, but certainly if you look towards the top, um, they don't look completely brown and dry and dead. And that's because um, if we let our sunflowers go all the way dry, there wouldn't be any left because the birds would have them. So you have to be observant in your garden. Seed saving is quite a bit about being observant. Um, in a home garden, you might be able to put a brown paper bag over the head of your sunflowers, but in this case, we're just harvesting them to take them inside to finish drying. So you want to leave them on as long as you can until you start noticing that um, some environmental factor, be it birds or rain, are affecting your your harvest. And I like to use the sunflower example because this is what the sunflowers look like after we harvested them and brought them into the field. Um, the ones that are hanging are the ones that we chose as seed stock. So those are the ones that are most suited, um, best suited to save seed and grow the following year. And so, you know, want to take extra care of those, make sure no mice get in there. And so they're, they're hanging those up to dry. Um, in this picture, right after this picture was taken, we had a rainstorm and water rushed in underneath the, um, the high tunnel there. And so we had to then lift everything up on pallets and, and make sure it dried properly. So again, you know, you, you have to be checking to make sure water moisture isn't affecting how your seeds are drying. Um, and that could be, you know, in this example, if you had them hanging in your um, garage and there was some moisture in there, you might want to look at it. Or if you left them out with a... Um, out in the garden to dry and, and you had a lot of rain, you might have to check in and make sure they don't have mold or that sort of thing on them as well. So it's a fine line between letting things dry as much as possible and, and preventing them from being eaten by pests or um, molding in you know, late, rain, late fall rains. So once your seed's fully dry um, and you're ready to, to process it and kind of, as I mentioned earlier, get the stems and the leaves and the branches away from um, your seed, you're going to do a process called threshing and winnowing. And the first step is threshing. And um, this, you're kind of liberating the seeds from the pod. You're not really trying to separate the seed and the chaff at all. You're just trying to break everything up. And so here we have a picture of um, Hans, and he is threshing, and in that bag, is uh, there's a lot of mustard seed. And so he's just kneeling on it. Um, depending on what kind of seed you're working with, you can, you can stomp on it and um, you can do a little jig right on top of it. Um, and you can do it in a pillowcase. You could do an, any sort of bag that's going to hold up to you um, crushing up the seeds and the stems and the seeds will work just fine. If, if you're doing a huge amount of seed, 
qual quantity. You know, there are machines. You can, you can do things um, on huge tarps laid out. Um, but if you're just doing something for the home garden, sometimes it's easiest just to um, shell your beans um, by hand when you're watching a movie on a cold winter day. So depending on how much you're doing will depend um, on what scale you'll do your threshing and winnowing. One thing I like to point out about Hans in this picture is he's kneeling and he's crushing from one side of the bag, and as soon as he's done with that, he's going to need to flip it over and do it from all angles um, of, uh, of that threshing bag because um, you really want to make sure all the seed is broken up. And you can see in this picture right here, he's oh, he has his hands on um, what, what's left of that kind of that garbage, whether it be the stems or the leaves or dirt, and the seeds have fallen through. So you can see those empty pods right there. So you can take out, you know, after you've done some threshing, pull it out and see how broken up it is before you, um, you know, before you stop. And you can, you can make sure that you're getting as much seed as possible. So once you finish the threshing, um, now it's time for the winnowing. And this is really, really the fun part. You're going to be use an air current to separate seed um, from the non-seed. The seed is the heaviest part of the plants, where all the, the information is. It's, it's where all the, um, the good stuff is. And so it works really well because um, you can use gravity and wind to separate it. And depending on what you're working with, um, the, some of the seed is lighter. And we'll get to some of those exceptions in a little bit. One example that's a good one to start with is radishes. Um, radishes look very different in their seed form. So here's when you'd harvest them for eating. They would look something like that. Here's when they're going to seed. And I'm sure as fast as radishes grow, that many, many of you have seen these little radish flowers. And if you keep letting them grow, they'll, turn in, they'll have these pods called salique pods. And eventually, those will turn brown and dry and hard, and that's what you're going to harvest. Um, however, your, your radish roots will look drastically different um, and maybe not so good for cooking at this point. And, and there's what the seed looks like at the end process. Um, beans would be another really good example of something that works really well with an air current. Um, you, these are what your beans would look like when um, you would usually eat them for snap beans. Here's your beans a little bit older as they're drying on the pod. The French might eat these as shelling beans. Um, a number of people are bringing that tradition of shelling beans back. Um, but here's when you want to harvest them for dry beans. And you can see uh, our field crew is going through and harvesting just the dry ones. And they'll, they'll do that throughout the season. Um, if you wanted to just let the, everything dry and then pull up the plants, you could do that too. Um, so what would happen at this point is, you know, going back and crushing and breaking up the seed pods. But then you can use a box fan to pour the seeds in front of, and the weight of the seeds, um, being the heaviest part, will fall directly down. And so you want them to land in something where they're not going to bounce out of. Um, if you had two five-gallon pails, it would be perfect. Um, and the, the chaff and the, the leaves and, and the other parts that you don't want will blow in front of the bucket. Um, and you can repeat this a couple of times, and it works pretty well to separate your seed out. And there's the, the end product after you've separated out all the chaff um, from the seed. <clears throat> Lettuce is another example, that, I, and I mentioned that that is um, it's a little lighter, so it's harder to use a wind current to separate the, the chaff and, and the parts from the seed. You can, I want you to notice in this picture that there is um, seeds are ripening at different times. So one thing about seed is um, you, you know, to go back and do a continual harvest because you want your seed to represent all of the plants. If you selected just the earliest seed um, and you did that for many, many years, over time you might be selecting for an early um, bolting lettuce variety. So it is important to kind of um, capture what the plant really is like by by going back and saving seed from the plant um, as it continues to mature. So here, um, here's an example of kind of how I mentioned you could do it with sunflowers, where you put a bag over the, the head of the sunflower. Here we're putting it over the, the flowering lettuces. And the seed will drop to the bottom and, and collect. Um, and, and as well, we're, we're keeping the birds away from it, too. 
um, and we're also preventing, um, there are different varieties growing in this area, so we're preventing um, seeds from blowing in um, to other plants as well. So depending again on whether you know you're doing a lot of seed or whether you're just doing seed for your own use um, or whether you'll be sharing your seed with other people, kind of determines how clean you want it to be. Um, so if you really need to get your seed clean, screening is a great way to do this. And this is a, a way of using two different screens, one where the seed is larger than the holes in the screen and another where the screen has smaller holes than the seed. And so that way what you can do is you can pour the seed over the top of the first screen and then it'll get stuck in the second screen and it'll let any, anything smaller like pieces of dirt and things like that will fall through. Anything larger will stay on the top screen. And you can, um, you can make these out of different size hardware cloth, um, window screens and wire mesh. Um, these ones that are pictured here again with Hans are commercially available, so if you're doing a large scale thing you can get those. They are a little pricey. Um, so what he's doing is he's taking, um, this is that same mustard seed from the earlier pictures, and so he's taking out the, the bulk of um, kind of the leftover material and pouring it into the top screen. And the seed falls through to the second, and some of that other stuff gets stuck up on that first screen. And here he is kind of going in and looking to make sure um, that, that he's gotten all the, the bits out of it that he wants to. All right, so we are going to um, talk a little bit about wet seed next. And wet seeds um, are anything that has damp flesh as opposed to seeds that, that ripen in the husk or the pod. These will include tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and squash and melons. Um, and all a lot of things that we like to grow in summer vegetable as summer vegetables. Um, so what you want to look for when you harvest seed is a little bit um, tricky because what we usually harvest um, wet seeded crops are from market maturity, and um, seed maturity is quite different. So indicators of wet seed maturity would be that the seeds sink in water, the seeds are really plump, um, and the fruit is completely mature, meaning we haven't harvested it when it's best for eating, but rather we've harvested it when um, the seeds had the longest opportunity to mature. And often this means that the, the fruits become rotten and, and they're much older than when you would harvest them for eating. A good example of that is eggplant. This is a beautiful picture of Varieties that would be wonderful in my kitchen, but here's what they look like when you want to harvest them for seed. They're large, they're, they're going to be bitter tasting, um, but that bottom part of that eggplant will be chock full of fully mature seed. So that's what you're looking for. Oops. Cucumbers, again, here they are at market maturity. Um, the seeds are small and slimy, and they're, they're not developed at all. If you saved those seeds, they would not grow. And here they are at seed maturity. They're orange, and, and, and sometimes they're mushy, and sometimes they're starting to rot a little bit, but the seeds are nice and big and, and fully mature again. So you can, uh, with wet seed saving, it's really, it's, well, with any seed saving, it's possible just to ignore your garden and end up with a really nice seed crop. Here they are again. You can see them harvesting at different times. So melons, cucumbers, and tomatoes are all processed with a fermentation method. And I'll tell a little bit about what that is. Um, in this picture, one of the garden crew members is harvesting melon seeds. Um, so, and again, here's another picture of somebody harvesting tomato seeds. This is Ben Cuisenberry. He was, at one point, America's oldest seedsman. Uh, he died a while back, but he was 93 when he was working on this, this tomato variety. Okay, so for the fermentation method, um, what you're going to do is, you know, regardless of whether you're working with cucumbers or tomatoes or um, melons, in your head you can probably picture that gelatinous coating that is around each seed. And that coating is the placenta and it has germination inhibitors in there. And the reason that it has that is because the perfect place for a tomato to mature is in that warm, dark fruit itself. So by having these germination inhibitors 
um, the seeds won't start sprouting inside your tomato. Although if you've um, been out in your garden and you've seen a tomato fall to the ground and um, it rots, then it, it'll sprout, you know, hundreds of little tomato plants right where that tomato did. And that's because it fermented or rotted. And we're trying to replicate that same process here in, in fermentation. So the step one is just to harvest um, the seeds. And you can do that by cutting the bottom and squeezing out all of the seeds and juice and pulp into a container. You, you're not just looking for the seeds. You can just um, be kind of messy and, and do that. And if you're doing this you know, before you make sauce or something like that with tomatoes, you can actually have your seed and eat it too. So that's nice. So here's um, pictures of things in the fermentation, or of tomatoes in the fermentation process. You can see that a layer of mold has come up to the top. And um, you can see kind of the flesh and the other bits that have also floated to the top. And just like in dry seed processing, in wet seed processing, the seeds are the heaviest part. So the seeds that are fully mature are actually going to sink to the bottom. If you have seeds in there that aren't mature, they're actually going to float up to the top. So it's another good way of kind of figuring out what seed's good and what seed is um, not fully mature yet and will not grow for you the following year. Depending on where you are, this fermentation process can take anywhere from 24 hours to four days. Um, if we're doing this in August and it's warm and humid, they might do it overnight. Um, if you're doing it this time of year when it's a little drier and cooler, um, you might want to try and you know, think of it like baking bread, put it on top of your fridge and make sure it's warm enough, uh, somewhere warm enough where it can ferment. Oh, also, if you are worried about fruit flies in your kitchen, um, you might want to put a paper towel over these or um, have them not uh, indoors, depending on the time of year, because there will be fruit flies and it will smell. With fermentation, um, you'll You'll notice that white layer, your, your good seeds will sink to the, the bottom, and then you're going to want to get a sieve, um, or even a, a glass jar works sometimes just fine without the sieve. And um, you're going to decant the seeds. So you're going to pour a little water into the jars, and then you can just pour off the top part. You can pour off the mold and the, the seeds that flow to the top and the flesh bits, and the bottom seeds are going to, um, the mature seeds are going to stay at the bottom of the jar. And if you keep decanting, so you pour off the top liquid, fill up the glass again and you, you kind of keep repeating this process, you're going to get rid of most of the flesh and the bits like that. And at that point, you can either you can um, put them in the sieve and, and rinse them off uh, to, to make sure you get all of the stuff off. Um, or sometimes they're clean enough just to put out and uh, dry. And you can do that a number of ways. Um, one way here is just on a paper towel. We use coffee filters a lot. We find that they, the tomato seeds really stick to paper towels and napkins, um, and they do not do that with um, plates, either paper plates, regular plates, coffee filters they won't stick to. Um, and one thing maybe you've been noticing throughout all of this is that um, we've been labeling everything. You might think you remember what you're working on, um, but you come back to it in four days and uh, you you forget which variety it was. So make sure you label, label, label when you're seed saving. Um, another thing to notice here is these seeds have been laid out to dry and they kind of, they dry in these clumps. So you want to come by every once in a while and break up the clumps um, of, of seeds so that everything can get fully dry before you put it into storage. All right, we'll talk a little bit about squash. Um, squash don't really have that uh, placenta like the others do. And any of you who have carved a pumpkin have certainly um, saved seeds and spread them out, only you've probably roasted them as opposed to put them away for next year's gardening. Uh, squash are broken into two categories, your summer squash, um, which we have here, and, and winter squash. And if you can picture the inside of this winter squash, it's kind of like harvesting a market mature cucumber. The seeds are kind of wimpy looking, they're not fully mature, um, they're not going to produce. So when you're seed saving, all of your squashes need to grow like they're winter squash. Winter squash, you let get quite a bit bigger. So for those of you who have those um, zucchinis that get away from you when you're on vacation, finally you don't just have to throw them or feed them to the chickens. You can actually save seed from them because that is what you want your zucchinis to look like when you're seed saving. 
So when the, when the uh, squash fruit are fully mature, um, this is a picture of our commercial production, and you don't need anything so elaborate, although I, I did put this picture in here to say that some squash can be quite hard to uh, crack open. So, But once you do, you can just scoop out the flesh. Um, this is a kind of like the screening method that I showed you earlier with the dry seed, only this time it's in five-gallon buckets, and the screening is at the bottom of the bucket. And that way you can just run a hose over it um, and, and get the smaller seed, the seeds to go through, the flesh stays on top, um, and then the seeds catch in the bucket below it. So if you're, you know, if you're doing stuff for a large garden, seed saving for a large garden, this is a good way to do that as well. There's a close-up, and you can see where the seeds will go through, and, and some of that stringy flesh will be left um, on that upper screen. Um, peppers can be treated as either dry seed processing or wet seed processing. Um, if they are if they're dry, you know, they're like your chili peppers that you've, you've let dry all the way, and you can pull out the seeds that way. Um, if you want to harvest them as wet seed, uh, you're going to have to make sure, that again, that they go to full maturity. So here we eat a lot of green peppers in this country, and green is not the color that you want your peppers to be when you harvest them. You want all of, all of your peppers to get to their, their ripest color. Um, in many cases, that's red, but it could also be orange, or um, it could be one of the many colors of peppers. Uh, here's an example of the red peppers, and this this is actually at the kitchen table at work. Um, we do taste testings, um, and this was the hot pepper taste testing, um, which is not a very good work assignment unless you like hot food. It can be painful. So here, um, peppers are really easy. You're just going to pull out the, the seeds and, again, let them dry on a paper towel. If you're saving seed from hot peppers, too, that, that capsaicin or the, the spicy part, the spicy uh, or the hot part of this, the pepper is on the inside and in the flesh. So you want to make sure you're using rubber gloves. Sometimes you're using even two rubber gloves. I know that when they do a lot of hot pepper seed processing here, they'll actually wear masks because you can um, inhale it at times. And so with hot peppers, um, be, you need to take some precautions. And again, with here's uh, cucumbers that are drying on screens. You can use window screens. Some of these we've made, uh, but many of our screens around here we've we've gotten from old building projects. And you just want to make sure they're somewhere where a lot of air is going to be able to uh, move across them. You're going to have to go through and mix them up every once in a while to make sure if they're sticking together that they're um, drying evenly. And to know when they're fully dry, um, you might want to try the snap test. And I'll tell you a little bit about how you know when your seeds are dry. Um, if, if you can bend a seed, it's not dry enough. So if you can, if you can um, bend uh, squash seed and it snaps, it's dry on the inside. Um, some things aren't so easy to tell if they're dry, like a, a spinach seed, for example. You couldn't really bend that. It's a very hard seed. Um, but you could crush it with a hammer. And when you would look inside, you would see that it was dry. Or on the other side, it would kind of have a milky color um, and texture on the inside because the seed is not dry. So don't be afraid to destroy a couple of your seeds to, to kind of explore and see if they've dried enough. Um, because it's really important, especially if you're doing long-term storage, that your seed is fully dry. Um, and the other thing you could do is if you had, a, say, a bowl of dry beans and you wanted to see if those are dry, you could um, have that bowl of dry beans um, and then slip a piece of paper or an envelope in it, leave it overnight, you come back the next day, and if there's any moisture on that piece of paper, kind of that wick that's been in with the beans, um, you know that they still need to dry a little bit. So seed storage, the first and most important rule of seed storage is that your seeds have to be dry. Certainly, you've all heard that seeds should also be cold, but again, for home gardeners and for, for everybody, dryness is the most important thing. This is a, a picture of our seed storage facilities um, where it's quite cold. I want to say we're, we keep it about negative 3 degrees Celsius, and um, we try when we pull those seeds out to distribute them or to work with them, you have to let them acclimate before you open up 
the package or the bottle or the jar. And that's because um, if you open it up right away, it'll can there'll be condensation on the inside and your nice dry seed will no longer be dry. So that's really important when we talk about um, cold storage. And um, so here, let me tell you a little bit about these different containers that you might want to store something in. If you're really confident that your seed is dry as it should be, you can use glass or plastic. Those are airtight things. No air is going to get into them, um, but also no air can escape. If you're not sure um, or are worried about how dry your seed is, paper or cloth might be a better option because um, air can escape those. Um, of course, the converse is if you live in a really humid climate, um, air can also get into your seed. So that's kind of a balancing act. If you can, you know, pass the snap test with your seed, I would recommend the plastic and the glass uh, for your seed storage. And then when you're storing these, you want the coolest and driest location in, in the house. Um, that might be the refrigerator, it might be a freezer, or it might be um, a drawer in the back um, in your office in a dark drawer. The thing about the refrigerator um, is that there is humidity in there, so it needs to be in an airtight container if you're going to put it in the refrigerator. And the same applies to the freezer. Um, with the freezer, you want to make sure it's a freezer that doesn't have a freeze-thaw cycle, meaning that um, when, when your freezer gets to a certain temperature, it starts to thaw a little bit, so you don't get that ice that builds up. That fluctuates the humidity quite a bit, and that can be bad for your seed. So if you have a deep chest freezer, that's a great place to store seed. Um, but be wary if you're putting it in your um, freezer at home that has the freeze-thaw cycle on it. And again, if you don't have it in an airtight container and you have it in paper cloth, a cool, dark draw drawer would probably be the best place for that. In terms of how long things will store, um, it, it really depends on three things, what the seed variety is, how dry it is, and again, how cool it's kept, um, and how constant the, the, the temperature that it's kept is. Um, if you're storing seed from year to year, you really shouldn't have too much of a problem, especially if it's something like tomatoes that have high germination rates. Um, if you want to store stuff for a long time, you might really want to make sure that you're um, getting seed in a freezer that is um, very, very dry. And optimal dryness is about 6 to 8%. So if you're trying to store seed for, for years, um, you want to get to those optimal conditions. And seed can last quite a long time when it's stored in optimal conditions. Um, one, one thing you can do before you put your seed into storage um, to know how, um, how viable your seed is, is you can do a germination test. And what that is, is if you have paper towels and a uh, spray bottle, you can lay out a certain number of seed, spray it, fold it up, and put it in a place where the seed will be allowed to germinate. And then once the seed's germinated, you take out the paper towels, you um, unroll them, and you can count what percentage um, or how many out of how many you germinated actually, um, or how many seeds you had actually germinated. And the reason that you'd want to do this is so you can put it in the storage um, with a certain percentage, and then if you want to store it for many years or you just want to know the following year how much seed you should be planting, um, you'll be able to have a good idea of, of, what, of how viable the seed is that you're working with. All right. Um, if you have any questions, I can recommend a couple of sites. First of all, you can go to our um, website at seedsavers.org. We also have a webinar series where um, that is online at this moment, so you don't have to register for them, but you could go look at specific topics online. Um, and the book Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth is kind of the complete guide to seed saving. And um, if you're really interested in it, I highly recommend that book because um, it is what we use around here um, at our right hand all the time. If you go to seedalliance.org, which is the Organic Seed Alliance organization, they have a free publication called A Seed Saving Guide for Gardeners and Farmers. And that's another great resource to get started. And it's free, which is very nice. So at this point, um, if there are any questions, I'd be willing to take them. Annie? Hi, Shannon. Our first question comes from Twitter at Let's Get Growing Garden. And their question is, if the tomatoes have already begun to spoil or mold, 
Can the seeds be stored and collected? Maybe we didn't have any questions. Um, I could clarify one thing I, I kind of missed a little bit, or a common question that I get with seed drying is, um, you know, should I should I put seeds in a uh, food dehydrator or should I put seeds in the oven um, or, um, you know, some way of kind of heating them to make sure they're dry. And at a certain temperature, seeds will not be, be viable anymore. So you really want to make sure that you're not doing that. And we don't recommend at all using a food dehydrator or a seed um, or, or the oven or anything like that to dry your seed. It's really hard to control the temperature um, and you don't want to end up roasting your seeds. Another thing people ask about is kind of the silica gel that you get in shoes, if that's a good way to, to make sure your seeds dry. And you can use that, just make sure you pull it out um, before you put it into storage because um, you don't really need it after, after the seed's been dry. Shannon? So if there aren't any other questions, I want to um, thank everybody so much for tuning in. Um, and if you have any questions, my email is shannon at seedsavers.org, and I'd love to follow up. Shannon, can you hear me? We seem to have lost our connection with Shannon, but I'll make sure that we get the answers to all of your questions. To Shannon and everyone who participated in the first session of the People's Garden Fall Webinar Series. This session will be posted online for any time viewing after closed captioning is complete. If you have questions about this series, you can email peoplesgarden at usda.gov. Join us again next Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time for our next webinar, Focus on Engaging Volunteers in the Gardens.